Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Alex Padilla. I'm from the Economics Department at Metro State. And I am in charge of hosting our speaker for today, for this morning. His name is Christopher Coyne. He's a professor in the Department of Economics at West Virginia University. He's also the North American editor of a review of Austrian economics. And today he's going to talk about his well-published publicized book, After War, The Political Economy of Exporting Democracy. Christopher? Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming. It's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, I want to thank uh, Professor Padilla for organizing this event and for bringing me to campus. I also want to thank the School of Business and also the Koch Foundation who uh, funded this trip and, and this talk. So I appreciate all that. It's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, and as Alex mentioned, what I'm going to talk about today is my book, After War, The Political Economy of Exporting Democracy. And what I'd like to do in my time is just cover some of the main themes and uh, concepts that I discuss in the book. And then we can go into more detail in the Q&A, depending on what people are interested in discussing. So in the book, I basically use the tools of economics to analyze the ability of the United States to export liberal democracy through military occupation. Uh, the U.S. has a long history of using military intervention to shape political, social, and economic institutions abroad. And while there are many different motivations for these interventions, the standard justification given by policymakers and politicians is the spread of liberal democratic values. I take this as given. In other words, I begin my analysis assuming that policymakers and politicians actually want to achieve what they say they want to achieve. Now, given this, it brings a central question to the forefront. And that question is, is military occupation an effective means to achieve the stated ends of spreading liberal democracy? In other words, I'm taking them at their word that the end they want to achieve, achieve is spreading liberal democracy, and I'm trying to analyze if the means, military occupations, is effective in doing it. While the historical record does indicate some clear cases of success, post-World War II, Japan and West Germany being the uh, most readily apparent examples, the historical record indicates more failures than successes. And it's my contention that the tools of economics can shed light on why we, deserve, uh, why we observe such disparate outcomes. In other words, why we observe some clear cases of success, but many more cases of failure. Now at this point, you might be asking yourself why an economist is talking about these issues. For the, most part, um, for the most part, excuse me, the topic of military occupation and reconstruction has been discussed by historians, political scientists, and those in public policy. But really, the whole process of reconstruction from the initial occupation through the various rebuilding of physical infrastructure and political, economic, and social institutions, as well as exit strategy, is all about economics. And let me try to clarify why this is the case. At its core, Economics focuses on individuals and assumes that individuals act purposefully. And all economists mean when we say this is that individuals have goals that they pursue and they attempt to pursue those goals given the best means known to them at the time of action. Moreover, economists assume that people respond to incentives. And this is pretty straightforward. When economists say that people respond to incentives, all we mean is that when the net cost of a behavior increases, people engage in less of it. And when the net costs fall, they engage in more of that behavior. And really, incentives are at the center of the reconstruction process. Occupiers must establish the rules of the game and ensure that those rules are sustaining and binding once they leave the country. In other words, they don't unravel once they exit the country. So from, a, from an economic standpoint, a successful reconstruction entails finding a set of incentives such that citizens of the occupied country prefer continuing within reconstructed institutions as compared to any of the available alternatives. And what I do in the book is I look at various reasons why occupiers have failed to establish the proper incentives, such that people prefer continuing within liberal democratic institutions after they exit the country. And I identify two broad categories of constraints, which lead me to be very skeptical of the US's ability to, uh, to export democracy through military occupation. And I'll talk about these two broad, broad categories uh, briefly. The first category is what I call internal constraints. And basically, internal constraints are constraints that facilitate cooperation and conflict within 
or between indigenous citizens. In other words, the citizens of the country being occupied. And I discuss several of them in the book, but for, given my time constraints today, I just want to focus on one, which is culture or belief systems or informal institutions. Culture is a critical aspect of any society. Now, for the most, oftentimes economists neglect culture. We talk about uh, policy and um, things that politicians can do, but we really neglect looking at the underlying culture of society and that, how that impacts policy. But culture is quite important. The importance of culture for a well-functioning democracy can at least be traced back to Alexis de Tocqueville in his book, Democracy in America, which was published in two volumes, the first in 1835 and the second in 1840. And basically what Tocqueville did was basically keep a diary of his travels throughout America. And what he was doing was looking at the various factors and mechanisms which led to democracy functioning well in America. And one of the things that Tocqueville pointed out was what, we, what he called the art of association. And what he emphasized is that Americans had a, what he called a unique habit for cooperating with each other. They formed civil society, they formed organizations which allowed them to engage in governance, cooperative behaviors, absent any kind of formal government imposing it upon them. It was voluntary cooperation that allowed for widespread cooperation outside of formal government imposing it and enforcing it. And Tocqueville pointed this out, uh, the art of association out, not just for cooperative ends, but also as an important check on central government. Because he said, look, government, formal government doesn't have to stand there and point a gun at you and tell you to do things. Americans have this unique habit for cooperating among themselves, absent anyone telling them to do it. So really what I'm getting at here is that a free society works best where the need for coercion is least. When you need a policeman on every corner, corner pointing a gun at you to follow a set of rules, you are going to have an unfree society. In stark contrast, when the art of association voluntarily emerges, in other words, it's not imposed from above, formal institutions will be sustaining. People will cooperate precisely because the underlying cultural and informal institutions support the formal institutions. So why is this important? Well, if you look at reconstruction efforts, typically what the United States attempts to do is occupy a country and then impose top-down institutions. Of course, we use nice rhetoric. We say we're including citizens and local leaders and that they're involved. But really, US policymakers and politicians have a view, a meta view, of what they want the society to look like. And they're trying to impose it top-down. This is evident when you look at the kind of variables that policymakers focus on. There's an important distinction between controllable variables and uncontrollable variables. Controllable variables are things we can change. Troop levels, exit strategy, timing of elections, amount of funding, and so on. Uncontrollable variables are things like culture, informal institutions, historical experiences, things we can't change with the switch of a lever or voting on a policy to increase or decrease, decrease troop levels. All emphasis by politicians and policymakers is on controllable variables. And the problem here is that social scientists, and I mean that in the broadest sense, not just economists, political scientists, sociologists, those in cultural studies, we know what a free society looks like. If I asked you what the characteristics of a free society look like, I think we could come to some kind of consensus around a list. Respect of property, the person, civil rights, religious rights, so on. I'm sure we could come up with some other general characteristics. But while we know what, what a free society looks like, we have an extremely poor understanding of how to go about getting it where it doesn't exist. In other words, designing it externally. We don't know how to go about doing it. If we could, exporting democracy would be simple. You would walk to your local museum shop, lay down $5, get a copy of the US Constitution, roll it up, mail it over to Iraq, and we'd be good to go. But of course, if we did that, the Constitution, the US Constitution, wouldn't have the same outcome that it has here in the United States, precisely because we have different informal institutions. So the main takeaway here is the gap between the know what and the know-how. We know what a free society looks like. We know the central characteristics. We don't know how to go about getting it where it doesn't exist. And this leads me to be quite skeptical that we can exogenously impose it and centrally plan it, precisely because we really don't know what we're doing. The second set of constraints is what I call external constraints. So while internal constraints focus on in, uh, relations between indigenous citizens, external constraints focus on the occupiers and policymakers and politicians back in the country sponsoring the reconstruction. In, in the case of Iraq and Afghanistan, for instance, the United States, since we're the ones sponsoring it. Now here's the problem. Policy is not generated in a vacuum. It's a complex political process 
that oftentimes generates very perverse and distorted outcomes. And the reason it, dis it, it, it generates perverse and distorted outcomes is precisely because there's numerous actors involved in the political process and they all face different incentives. And even if they have the best of intentions when they start out, oftentimes perverse policy is the outcome. So in the book, I go into detail about this political process, because, but because of time constraints today, I'm just going to spend a couple minutes and discuss a few of them. And during the Q&A, we can talk about more. So policy is really the outcome of four groups. Individual voters, you and I, average citizens who are voting on things, interest groups, bureaucrats, and elected officials. And again, given my time constraints, I'm going to focus on interest groups and bureaucrats just to give you an idea of how some of the dynamics here work. Let's start with bureaucrats. Democrats have often criticized the Bush administration for poor planning, for poor administration of the Iraq reconstruction, and they say, look, if things had been done differently up front, it would have been a different outcome. But this overlooks the fundamental problem. Too often, these issues of reconstruction and military occupation get emotional and ideological. It's Democrats versus Republicans. But the power of economics is that we're able to strip away all that emotion and look at incentives. And guess what? Both Democrats, Republicans, Libertarians, Green Party members, Constitutional Party members, and every other party out there faces it and responds to incentives. So it doesn't matter what political party you're, at, you're part of, you face incentives. So when Democrats say, look, it's the Bush administration's fault, it's just not true. What's the, it's the fault of the government in the broadest sense. And really what happened when the reconstruction of Iraq and Afghanistan started was that all the different bureaus in the government started fighting with each other. Now you might ask, why did they start fighting? Aren't they supposed to be united towards some common goal of exporting democracy, right? That's what they say they want to do. Well, here's how bureaucracies work. They're not profit-driven, so they're not motivated by profit. They're non-profit by definition. So the way they operate, or the way they're successful, is by maximizing their budget and maximizing the number of subordinates, the number of bureaucrats working in that bureau. Well, how do you do that? You be make yourself important. And how do you make yourself important? You outcompete all the other bureaus. You say, the State Department, we're the really important ones, right? And the Defense Department saying, no, we're really the important ones. I want to control the reconstruction, right? And really, what are their motivations? They want to maximize their budget and the number of subordinates working for them, because that's how bureaucrats judge their success, absent the profit motive. So what happens? Despite the fact that all these different bureaus are supposed to be united in a common goal of reconstructing Iraq, Afghanistan, and all previous reconstructions and all future reconstructions, they end up fighting with each other. And that's precisely what happened. And of course, if people actually took the time to look back at past reconstructions, they'd see that bureau bureaucratic infighting existed in every single reconstruction, even during the successful reconstructions of post-World post -World War II Japan and West Germany. In fact, in the book, I discuss how the reconstruction of Germany was actually slowed down precisely because there was so much bureaucratic infighting. Under George Bush Sr., under Bill Clinton, all those reconstruction and military interventions all suffered from these issues. Then when you bring the United Nations, NATO into it, it just gets that much worse because you have all these turf battles between people that are trying to stake their claim. I want to be in charge, right? And what happens is you get all this infighting. So what I want to emphasize is that the failure or success of Reconstruction is not an issue of political party, it's an issue of incentives. And bure bureaucrats and bureaucracy often generates incentives which generates very bad outcomes. In this case, fighting while they should be cooperating towards some common goal. So let's move up and to the right and talk about interest groups momentarily. Now interest groups are basically groups of voters, citizens, you and I, that join together for some common cause. And here's why. One individual vote really doesn't have that much sway. Individually, we, we vote, we all have a vote, but it really doesn't matter that much. But if I can form a whole group of people that agree with me and we can all vote together, then we can undertake a coordinated action and actually potentially have an influence. And of course, we see this on a daily basis, right? This is why presidential candidates, for instance, don't stand out on, on street corners and shake hands all the time. They go after securing the union endorsements, right? Why do they do that? because they can get all those, that big block of votes all at once instead of individually securing votes. So interest groups coordinate together for some common cause and what they attempt to do is concentrate benefits on their members while dispersing costs among all other voters. 
Many of us don't realize how we're influenced by interest groups, but we all pay a cost, whether it's a couple extra cents per gallon of milk when we go to the supermarket for agricultural products. We all pay a little bit more than we normally would. And the reason we do is because these producers, we receive enormous subsidies from the government. They lobby the government, they get these subsidies, and you and I, as average taxpayers, foot the bill. But the bill is relatively small for each of us. If we spend 10 cents extra per gallon of milk, we really don't care, right? It's not that much relative to, to our total expenditures. But when you aggregate that across all milk purchasers, that's a lot of money. Well, guess what? Just like there's an agricultural lobby, a teacher's lobby, and lobbies for lots of different things, there's also a military lobby. It's what's called the military-industrial complex. And what the military-industrial complex does is lobby the government, number one, to engage in war and conflicts and interventions abroad. But then once we undertake conflicts, they also lobby government to be the main provider, to get contracts, right? Now, what's a perfect example of this? We all heard about Halliburton in the news, right, after uh, we invaded Iraq. And of course, Dick Cheney was the CEO of Halliburton, right? And they got the most, most money for the Iraq reconstruction, and everyone, everyone said, wait, there's some kind of favoritism going on here. But again, people got too caught up in the ideology, because if people had just read the history of Halliburton, they would have realized something. Actually, under the Clinton administration, Halliburton got more total contracts than they did under the Bush administration. And actually, the relationship between the United States government and Halliburton goes all the way back to the Johnson administration. In other words, Halliburton's been in bed with government, getting lots of money for both domestic internal construction projects as well as international contracts for decades. So again, it's not that the Bush administration loves corporations and the Democrats don't. It's that politicians respond to incentives. They want to maximize their votes, and one way of doing that is through interest groups. So why is this bad? Well, here's the problem. Let's say the reconstruction effort is undertaken with the best of intentions. We really want to accomplish this, all right? But what happens? Interest groups start lobbying government. You get them trying to manipulate policy, manipulate contracts. And what happens is you get perverse outcomes, right? We've all read articles in the newspaper about all the wasted money that went to Halliburton and the other main contractors, right? So it was basically a waste of money in a lot of cases. We have them, for instance, even doing the most basic services. For instance, serving dinner to our troops. They were charging three times the amount that we could have done if we had hired another provider. That's just a waste of resources, right? That could have been used for other things, whether it's other parts of the reconstruction, whether it is social security, bailing out corporations, which politicians like to do now, right? Or returning it to the taxpayers, perhaps, right? Not taxing people, because ultimately you and I foot the bill for this stuff, right? So you can see how interest group manipulation will often generate perverse outcomes, because they're going to try to concentrate benefits on them for themselves, even if it means distorting the ultimate outcome of policy, okay? Now I have a couple more moments, so let's keep going around since I have more time. So that's interest groups and bureaucrats. Now, now please note, all these different groups are interacting at once. So you have bureaucrats fighting with each other. You have interest groups trying to manipulate policy to benefit themselves. Let's talk about individual voters. You and I have an incentive to remain rationally, what economists call rationally ignorant. Now what does this mean? We all realize that no one vote matters. When we go to the voting booth, none of us say, you know what, today when I go, I'm going to swing this election, right? It's going to be all me. If I don't go, it's going to be tied, but if I do, I'm going to swing it, right? No, we, we realize that no one vote counts, right? Some of us vote, some don't, whatever. We can talk about that, but we don't have to right now. It's part of this talk. But what really incentives do we face as voters? Well, we know who's running. We know generally what they stand for. Very few citizens, voters, know detailed records of politicians, right? I do this all the time to students. I'm like, look, which presidential candidate do you like? Right? They'll say McCain, Obama, whatever. And I say, okay, can you please tell me Senator McCain or Senator Obama's exact voting record on abortion? I want the exact thing. Or foreign policy. What, what's their voting history? I don't know. Well, then what do you know? Well, Obama's for hope and change of bringing home the troops and McCain's not. Right? It's like, okay, well, that really doesn't mean anything. It's a nice, catch, nice catchphrases, but really doesn't tell us anything meaningful. Right? Why don't voters go do research on the candidates? It seems like picking the president or your representative is a pretty important choice, right? It's not like buying a cup of coffee in the morning. It seems like it's pretty important. So it seems like we'd want to know lots of stuff. When we go buy a car, we do lots of research. When we go buy a house, we do lots of research. But when we pick our representatives, we don't. Is it because people don't care? Because they're stupid? No. It's because of the incentives they face. They realize, of course, that their vote really doesn't matter that much in terms of swinging the election, so why would they expend all that energy 
going to get detailed re voting records and figuring out really what politicians stand for. Instead, what they do is catch on or pick up on very general, broad platform claims, which is precisely why politicians invest so much money in doing it, right? John McCain doesn't like people because he doesn't want universal health care. He doesn't like six people, right? Barack Obama does, right? It's like, what? That doesn't make sense, right? But of course, the politicians, what they're trying to do is just ca create catchphrases, right? Hope, change, maverick. These are all examples. It's happened through every political campaign. So why does this mean? What it means is you and I know a reconstruction in Iraq and Afghanistan is going on. Most people know it costs a lot of money. But if you really push people on it, they don't know how much it costs. They don't know how funds are being allocated. They typically go along political party lines. If you're Republican, you like it. If you're Democrat, you don't. But if you really push them and get into a discussion with them and say, look, I'm trying to understand really why you don't. Please, let's talk about this. They really don't know the details, right? So what happens? Well, again, you have voters trying to influence politicians to undertake certain policies, and they really don't know what they're talking about. So you have uninformed individual voters, informed interest groups, but they're trying to manipulate policy for their own purposes, bureaucrats that are fighting with each other. So you can see pretty quickly how we're going to get screwed up policies here, right? Even though we're all not, I'm not saying anything about the quality of people of being good or bad. I don't know. I've never met everyone, right? But some people, some are good, some are bad. I imagine on average they're no worse than anyone else. What I do know is they all respond to incentives, right? So let's go to, all the way to the, um, let's see, le your left here. All right, elected officials. What incentives do elected officials face? Well, elected officials that are going to eventually um, be out of office because of their end of their term limits want to basically uh, maximize their votes if they're going to get reelected or uh, maximize uh, what they do in office, right? Maximize what they do in office, their legacy, um, what they can accomplish. But here's what they do. They maximize benefits when they're in office and they extend the costs into the future because they're not going to have to foot the bill anymore. This, of course, is why we have so many, so many problems reforming our programs, Social Security, Education, Medicare, Medicaid. Why? Because politicians say they're going to do stuff. They spend lots of money, right? But then they're out of office. And then the next politician comes in, and they do the same thing. But no one has an incentive to take into account the long-term costs because the next politician foots the bill. So what is an example of this in the context of Reconstruction? Well, you may or may not re remember Lawrence Lindsay. In 2002, Lawrence Lindsay was an economic, economic advisor to the Bush administration. And before we went into Iraq, Lawrence Lindsay came out. And you may or may not remember this. He said, look, I'm not judging if we should go to Iraq or not, but I'm estimating the cost is going to be one to $200 billion. Guess what? The Bush administration went nuts. How dare you say this? It is ridiculous. The oil will pay for it. It will not cost close to that. He was forced to resign, if you recall. Of course, the economists Joseph Stiglitz and Linda Bilmes just released a book called The Three Trillion Dollar War, where they estimate the costs, when all is said and done of the war, between one and three, up to three trillion dollars, when we take into account all of the factors, right? Because we just don't care about what we're spending t today. There's veteran costs, there's health care costs, there's depreciation costs, we have to replace military equipment, so on and so forth. There's lots of long-term costs that you and I will fit the bill for, our kids will, our grandkids, and so on. Right? But politicians now don't take those long-term costs into account, precisely because they won't foot the bill. They'll be out of office, right, giving speeches for $300,000, right, a speech. So they don't really care. So again, you have short-sighted elected officials, uninformed individual voters, informed interest groups that are trying to manipulate policy for themselves, and infighting between bureaucrats. What do you get? Really screwed up policy. Really screwed up policy. Again, I'm not making quality judgments about these people being good or bad. They just respond to incentives. And the incentives are a political system or such that you get really perverse outcomes. And this explains why we observe so many failures in reconstruction efforts. Notice that this applies equally to Democrats, Republicans, and any other political party. They all respond to incentives, which is why you get perverse outcomes across political parties. So what are the main takeaways? Well, the central argument of the book is that policymakers and occupiers face an array of constraints, both internal and external to the country being occupied, which makes reconstruction efforts more likely to fail than to succeed. Further, the extent or the magnitude of these constraints will tend to be greatest in those countries most in need of the, uh, the outcomes that reconstruction efforts attempt to engender. One of the core themes in the book and one of the points I want to emphasize is that failure in reconstruction efforts is not a matter of political ideolo ideology. 
It's not a matter of better planning, trying harder, more troops, a surge or no surge. What it is a function of, what the failure is a function of, is the inability of the government to centrally plan the complex array of institutions that underpin a free society. Again, we just don't have a good idea of how to go about getting these things where they don't exist. So we face imperfect information. We know what a free society looks like, but not how to go about getting it where they don't exist. We face a non-neutral political system. The polit policies are generated by a complex array of groups all interacting and all facing different incentives, which often generates a perverse outcome. And what this leads to is failure. So what are some alternatives? Well, I discussed three in the book. These, uh, the first two are ones that are discussed mainly in political science literature, but also public policy literature. One's piece called peacekeeping. All right, now here's the idea behind it. The idea behind peacekeeping is that instead of trying to go over to these countries and tell them what to do or impose institutions upon them, we keep the peace and then we let them figure out what to do. So we would send our troops in, not to impose some kind of Western style political, economic and social system, but instead to just simply maintain the peace, prevent conflict. And then hopefully some kind of institutions would emerge on their own that would be self-sustaining. Now, on the face of it, this seems like a good alternative. It overcomes a lot of the problems I talked about. The idea that we don't know what to do, we're not trying to impose things upon people, right? We're not telling them what to do, we're allowing them to engage in self-determination. But ultimately, I reject this alternative for a couple reasons. The first is that peacekeeping missions typically haven't worked very well. And here's the reason why. Even though we go in and we say, look, we're just here to keep the peace, we're not here to tell you what to do, the people on the ground, the indigenous citizens, don't view us as peacekeepers. They view us as picking sides. This is precisely what happened in Somalia. Of course, what happened in Somalia is we went in originally to keep the peace, to deliver humanitarian aid. But here's what happened. You had groups A and B, and there was lots of others too, but A and B shooting at each other. We try to bring A aid. We say, here's some water, food, medical care, so on. It seems like a neutral, nonpartisan thing to do, right? We're trying to help people. But group B didn't view it that way. Group B didn't say, okay, they're just helping them out, we'll leave them alone. No, they say, look, they're helping our enemy, the people we're trying to take down. So guess what? They're the enemy now, right? The various groups started attacking U.S. peacekeepers and U.N. peacekeepers, and eventually we were forced to pull out. Of course, if you've seen the movie Black Hawk Down, that's what it's about, the Somalia occupation, right? So there's that issue. Even though we go in and we try to maintain neutrality, typically the various groups involved don't be as, see us as being neutral. There's another problem as well. People in the United States and other Western countries like to talk about democracy a lot. Democracy's good, right? We all like it. Our political leaders talk about it all the time. Well, here is uh, an important point to keep in mind. Democracy is not inherently good or bad. It's a mechanism for making collective decisions. It's just ma typically majority rule, right? We have to make a decision as a group. Democracy is one way of doing it. Typically, in, in the United States and other Western countries, when we talk about democracy, we're not just talking about the voting part of it. We're talking about the constraints on the winners, right? Constitutional democracy or liberal democracy, right? Our founding fathers, of course, realized as well what they were trying to do was to place constraints on the people that, were, that won the election so that they couldn't abuse their power and that a minority group couldn't come to power and exploit the majority or take advantage of any small group, right? So really what we care about it's not so much democracy, people voting. It's not that it's unimportant, but that's not really what we want. We want is liberal democracy, constitutional democracy. We want an election with constraints on those winners so that they protect people's private property, their right to engage in civil society, religious freedom, so on and so forth. And that's a very important distinction that most people neglect. Democracy can generate very bad outcomes if there is not constraints on rulers. And of course, Hitler came to power through uh, a democratic election, if you will remember. Uh, so what's the problem here? Well, if we keep the peace and we let things emerge, the United States often runs into a bind, which is what if we don't like the outcome? Oftentimes, we talk about self-determination, letting people choose what they want to do, but then sometimes it conflicts with our foreign policy. It conflicts with what we view as being right for whatever reason. And then we're put in a really tough bind. We can cut across what we originally said, just kidding, we're not really for self-determination, just for self-determination as long as it's what I want. Or we can let it be, right? But oftentimes letting it be is not a preferable outcome from those in power. And we, run, we put ourselves in a bind. So when you combine these two things together with peacekeeping, it doesn't appear that this is a long-run sustainable strategy. It's also unclear how long we'd have to keep the peace. Oftentimes 
what, what political scientists call consolidated or, or mature democracies take decades, if not centuries, to develop and sustain, right, a, a, as a self-sustaining entity. Keeping the peace for centuries could be a very high cost proposition for a variety of reasons. Another option is brute force. And this might sound surprising to you, but this exists and there are academic writers writing on it. In simple terms, it's colonization. So people say, look, here's what the problem in Iraq and Afghanistan was, self-determination. We let the Iraqis and Af 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 Afghanis choose. We should have colonized them. We go in, we make it a protectorate of the United States under military rule, and we say, look, we're here to help you. Right? We're here to help you for your own good. I'm in charge. You're doing what I tell you. And when I, when I deem that you are fit and capable of governing yourselves, then I will leave. Now, I talk for a variety of reasons why this is a bad strategy. I don't go into any of the moral reasons, and they do exist, but I'm, I'm, I'm talking as an economist, so I can't really talk as an, uh, as an ethicist. Uh, but, but from an economic standpoint, this doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is precisely because it will often require a level of force that is extremely costly. In other words, when people break your rules, you have to either be willing to throw them in jail or to shoot them. That is a very high cost strategy for maintaining any kind of order. It's extremely costly in terms of resources, in terms of revolutions against the US forces and so on. Moreover, it doesn't overcome the fact that we still don't know how to create liberal democratic institutions where they don't exist. So we could imagine colonization going on for centuries. And of course, if you look historically, one of the many reasons that developed nations have collapsed is precisely because they overexpanded their reach in the world. They extended, they, they were wealthy and developed, and they extended their reach so far that they basically bankrupted their own country. Right, and this is a real threat of colonization. So the conclusion I come to, and then I'll finish up and we can discuss, is a third alternative, which is I believe the United States should adopt a default position of non-intervention and free trade. And I'll talk a little bit about that. First, let me talk about why I'm an advocate of non-intervention and free trade. <clears throat> well, let me talk about free trade first, and then we'll come back to non-intervention. Free trade. Economics, or economists, excuse me, all for the most part, agree on the benefits of trade. Trade makes us better off. And most people, unfortunately, average citizens don't understand this, which is why we hear so much complaining about outsourcing, people from Mexico, India, China stealing our jobs, and so on. But here's the thing, and this is the way I try to explain to my students. We all buy stuff on a daily basis. In other words, we engage in trade with people. Maybe we stop at the local coffee shop, the local breakfast shop, we go to a store and buy stuff. Typically, it's local. But that's trade, and it makes us better off. How do I know it makes us better off? Well, of course, voluntary trades, usually when they end, what do both parties say? Thank you, thank you, please come again. Guess what? If you're hurting someone, usually you don't say thank you, right? You're not like, thank you, please come again, rob me. Right? It's like, no, thank you, right? Thank you, please come again, I appreciate your business. Well, here's something to remember. If it applies at the local level, it applies at the county level, the state level, interstate trade. Few people would say that people commuting from Connecticut to New York Right? No one would say, New York, Connecticut, you don't hear Connecticut people saying, New York stealing our jobs. Right? They're stealing our Connecticut workers. This is unfair. We have to ban trade between Connecticut and New York. Right? No one says that. I wonder why. Because fundamentally, people realize gains from trade. What they don't fundamentally realize is that when it comes to nation borders, which are arbitrarily dr drawn at some point in our history, that uh, the same logic applies. In other words, trading with someone in Mexico, China, India, any other geographic location is no different than trading with your local grocer, your lo local coffee producer, and so on. If you understand the benefits of one, you understand the benefits of another. One of the main reasons people don't understand this is because they tend to think in nation states. China is stealing our jobs. India is stealing our jobs. Well, unfortunately, only individuals trade. China is not a person. Right, is a geographic location that consists of people, just like Denver is a geographic location that consists of a lot of people. Right? Individuals trade with each other, not countries, not nation states, not states, people. And when people trade, they do it because it makes them better off. So when we restrict trade, what we do is make people worse off. We restrict the trading opportunities available to them. So what, what does this mean? Well, there's major economic benefits to free trade major economic benefits. If we really want to help poor countries, right, again, politicians always have rhetoric about helping poor countries. And typically, it's foreign aid, right? We hear Bono out there all the time saying, we need more foreign aid, right? Foreign aid, if we had more money, we could cure it. It's the lack of resources. Well, maybe there's reasons I'm skeptical about that. 
But the best way to help poor people around the world is to grant them access to U.S. markets. But we don't do that. The U.S. has higher trade tariffs, barriers than uh, China. Of course, people think of China as a communist country and America somehow as a free market system. But America is very unfree. We have lots of regulation, lots of barriers to trade. And we prevent lots of, lots of countries, lots of people in those countries from trading with us, which makes them worse off. Now you might say, why do we do that? If it makes us worse off, it doesn't make sense that we would restrict trade. Well, if you go back to my previous slide about interest groups, that's why we do it, right? American car dealers, for instance, like the fact that we restrict trade with foreign car dealerships because then they don't have to compete with them. And that's why we have many trade barriers in place. So how can we help weak and failed states and poor countries around the world? Here's how we can help them unilaterally reduce trade barriers, right? The other mistake people often make is they only think of reductions in trade barriers as bilateral. I'm only going to reduce my trade barriers if you reduce yours. And if you raise yours, I'm going to raise mine in retaliation. This is wrong-headed. It's the wrong way to think about it. Because trade barriers make you and I, average citizens, worse off. We have to pay more for goods and services than we otherwise would have to. So unilaterally lowering trade barriers in the United States makes consumers better off. It also grants people around the world access to our markets. Now, there's clear economic benefits to that. But what I want to emphasize is there's also cultural benefits to that as well. We want to spread liberal democracy, Western values, respect for property, respect for other people's views, respect for civil and religious freedoms. But people around the world view the United States as being hypocritical. We say these things, and then we occupy their countries, we stick guns in their faces, we have tanks, and we tell them what to do. And they say, wait, I thought I just heard you say you were going to let us engage in self-determination, that you respect us. But then why are your soldiers here in my backyard? There's an alternative to this. An alternative to convincing people at gunpoint is to actually convince them, to expose them to Western values, Western ways of life, and then to allow them to choose for themselves. And guess what? Some people will choose not to buy into the program. They won't buy into Western values. But part of fundamentally respecting other people is agreeing, that, agreeing on that. Now, there's an important point here, and a lot of people misunderstand my core argument. They say, you're a pacifist. You just want peace. You'd let people come bomb us, and you'd be OK with that. And I say, no, that's wrong. Right? I talk about this in the book. I think the US government should protect US citizens. If people are going to attack us, it's the US government's job to protect us. What I don't think the US should do is be in the business of telling people around the world how to live at gunpoint. And what I, want to, uh, what I want to impress upon the audience is that I think an alternative that's often overlooked is the importance of trade with people, granting them access to our markets, saying, look, this is how we do things. Observe it. We're willing to trade with you. If you don't want to, that's OK. That's fine. Right? We respect that. But if you'd like to, we would very much like to trade and engage with you and your citizens. And we would appreciate and value that. Now, you might say, OK, this is crazy. Right? This is this radical position you're, you're claiming. And I want to say, no, it's not. If you understand the history of the United States, it's actually a quite a realistic position for a number of reasons. And I want to just quickly outline them, and then I'll finish up. The first is history. If you look back at the founding fathers of the United States of America, what did they emphasize? Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, John Quincy Adams, they all emphasized the importance of economic ties with all, cult, uh, political ties with none. Why did they do that? They did it because, precisely because they realized when you got bogged down in political alliances with people around the world, right, you overextended yourself and you eroded the core freedoms at home, the core institutions of freedom in the United States. Right? When they were designing the institutions, what they wanted was sustainable institutions that would allow us to live free. And they realized that when we got bogged down in these alliances, we would, be, we would waste resources, squander resources. We would get bogged down helping these small groups of people abroad. And that, those, that interest, helping those small interests, would oftentimes cut against the broader institutions in the United States. So we have history on our side, the very foundations of our country. Now, the response I hear is, well, that was a different time. We can't use those standards anymore. I don't like that response, precisely because if we applied to everything, we'd have nothing. Well, when they said people have right to religious freedom and personal freedoms, times were different. Right? We can do away with those things now. It was different then. Well, of course it was different then. Time progresses. No one can deny that. Right? But I still think their fundamental vision is as applicable today as it was back when they first stated it. The second is that political leaders realized the benefits from free trade too. 
George Bush has, has committed to creating a free, tra uh, free trade zone with the Middle East uh, over the next decade. Um, in uh, 2003, Senators Baucus and McCain tried to enact a free trade agreement with the Middle East that would unilaterally reduce barriers to our markets because they realized that was the quickest way to integrate them and to make them free and wealthy. Unfortunately, that bill failed to pass, but they recognized the benefits of trade. Uh, there's the generalized system of preferences, which was established in 1976, which grants poor countries around the world free access to our markets, unilateral reductions in trade because politicians and policymakers realize the benefits of trade. So we have precedent for this. We have precedent. So in sum, I want to make clear, I'm not arguing here for pacifism in every case. What I'm arguing is that based on economic reasoning, the fact that people act purposely and respond to incentives, efforts to export democracy through military occupation are more likely to, f uh, to fail than succeed. And this is not an ideological argument, it's a purely economic argument. My argument is not that the United States government should not protect us, it's that the, we should not be in the business of occupying and imposing our worldview on other people around the world. And to be clear, my argument is not that free trade and non-intervention is a panacea. Our choices, of course, always are not among first best. They're always among second and third best, imperfect alternatives. And my contention is that a commitment to non-intervention and free trade is the best means of creating some kind of sustainable global peace. Thank you. I guess we we'll take questions if anyone has any. Another microphone here. Go ahead. My economy students are welcome to talk. <laughs> I just have a quick question on there's a table in the book at the beginning about the polity four scores. Yes. And um, Iraq, the occupation in 89 or 90 is not on there, and I was wondering why not, and was it considered something else? Uh, yes, so basically there's a, there's a table in the book, it's in the first chapter, where I look at the success and failure of reconstruction efforts kind of as an overview, and if they were, I look at the, the there's something called the polity index, which is an attempt to measure liberal democracy and autocracy. And what I do is I look at the scores before the occupation and after to see if they've changed, because really we'd want to see an improvement. We'd want to see movement towards a liberal democracy. So the question was that the first um, Gulf War basically is not on there. And the reason it's not on there, by the way, it's not my list. I, com I combined it from um, a bunch of political science resources. Um, so I thought I'd free write off the political scientists. But um, the reason that's not on there is because it's not considered an occupation to generate political, social, and economic change. It was to basically um, to, to protect a certain group of people that was being attacked by Saddam Hussein. So we never, if we had overthrown Saddam Hussein and tried to establish a new order, then it would be on there. But we didn't do that. We left prior to that. So that's why it's not considered um, an example. Hi. Sorry, I missed the first part. I came in late. But in regards to uh, free trade, I wanted to bring up the issue of fair trade um, because I believe that that's really more the core. And if you look at the Bretton Woods Treaty and the debt that's going on in these poor countries, that's really, to me, when you look at the WTO, IMF, World Bank, World Economic Forum, NAFTA, CAFTA, GAP, FDA, we can go on and sure, on. Yeah. All these things are what's keeping people down. So if you talk about just free trade, it's really not fair trade. What do you and mean by fair trade, just so we can clarify? Fair trade. So fair trade would mean if you are in, you know, um, what is it, uh, Dominican Republic, uh, um, but I'm um, bananas, mm -hmm. if I'm getting the right country here, and you are making, you know, a few cents an hour, and you sell it here, and then we go buy this produce, and it's not real, it's not a fair trade, because the person harvesting that, you could say, in uh, Central America, where we're getting coffee grounds, so th the beans that are harvested there, the people are not being paid a fair wage, yet what's being traded, is, so it's not really a fair trade, because here in the wealthier countries, we're getting the benefit of the poor slave labor 
of the poor nation. So it's not fair. What, what's a fair? Just I want to just push you. So, just so, so, so what's, so a, what's a fair, a fair, wa what's a fair a, wage, for instance? So f first of all, cancel the debt. That would be number one. Um, get rid of all these institutions, um, IMF, all these things. Get rid of all that. Restructure NAFTA. All these thi those things need to be restructured. So a fair trade would be for the people of these nations to be having a livable wage so that they're not impoverished. And so that if they're paid that, then yes, it, the, the price may go up here, but that's how you balance that inequity and help those impoverished countries. So, you know, I, I really have this big thing about fair trade versus free trade. I think there's a huge distinction, and I think that needs to be made. Am, am I Yes, I'm going to make a couple points. I, I have a feeling you're not going to like my, my answers, but let me just make them. And this, this is a very complex topic. Typically, when I hear fair trade, I, it's a catchphrase for some special interest groups that, get, that, that want something. Now, he, now, here's a couple things. I agree with you on the following points. International institutions and the governments of wealthy countries, because of special interest groups, by the way, have manipulated trade agreements to benefit them at the expense of other people. So I agree with you. We should abolish these institutions as well. I think we should abolish free trade agreements. Free trade agreements are not really free, because if you look at historically what's happened, right, free trade is no barriers. Right? We have this confusion in this country. First of all, so, some terminology. Privatized means no government. Right? So when we say privatized Social Security and we're like, we only can have part of your money back, that's not private. Right? That's government telling you what to do and you control a little bit. Likewise, when we say free, it's that I get to walk up to you, offer you an exchange. You can either take it or leave it. It's voluntary. Or you can walk away. That's free trade, my understanding of it. So when we in impose certain agreements, and it's typically governments doing it because governments engage in free trade agreements, the government of a poor country and the government of the United States does it. Typically the government of the U.S. or other developed countries strong arm them into generating preferable for the U.S. So you're right there, right? So I agree, let's abolish all this stuff, right? My, I think free trade and fair trade align perfectly. When trade is truly free, when I can walk in and walk up to someone and say, I would like to exchange this, do you want it or not? If not, fine, I'll walk away. If so, let's make an exchange and let's come to some kind of mutual agreement, whatever it is, a few pennies or a lot of money, right? That's free and fair to me. When they're being manipulated by outside sources, and when I say outside sources, I mean governments and special interest groups, I agree, that's not fair trade or it's not free trade. So yeah, let's abolish all this stuff, I'm all for it, and then let people trade, but here's what's gonna happen. And you're not, this is the part you're not gonna like. Poor countries are poor, it's a fact. No poor country got wealthy because of um, all of a sudden they j artificially jacked up their wages. If that was the case, by the way, we'd have a cure to economic poverty around the world. Instead of sending foreign aid, we should just go to the African government and say, look, please wage your minimum wage to $1,000 an hour, right, or $20 an hour, and then people will get paid really well and they'll be wealthy, right? But something happens when you do that, which is no one wants to pay people in Africa, people in, in poor countries $20 an hour, so no one would do business there, right? So, so what poor countries need to do, and, 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 and this is not, and of course the, the power of economics is it limits utopias, right? Poor countries becoming the United States tomorrow is not in the feasibility set. It took the United States a long time to become the United States and other developed countries as well, and we were poor once too, right? So they have to go through all those poor stages, they have to go through an industrial revolution, which is not pretty, but they have to do it. We don't have any strategy for instantaneous growth. We don't know it as economists. We pretend we do, Right? But we really don't at the end of the day. So the best we can do is free people to trade. There's going to be people that make very little money. We don't like it in the first world country. But when we do this, we actually hurt these people. When, when people protest against sweatshops, I'm a big advocate of sweatshops. I buy stuff from sweatshops all the time. And here's why. The, you don't buy stuff from sweatshops, you put those people out of business. You've made them worse off. Right? Because if you try to force the minimum wage high, if you say I'm boycotting it, think about what boycotting a, a sweatshop is. I'm not buying from it, which means they don't produce stuff, which means they're what? Starving, right? Selling themselves in the prostitution, selling their kids in the prostitution. Terrible things. So my argument is not that we should embrace sweatshops as being good. They're not an ideal, but the option isn't working in a sweatshop or working at Microsoft, right? It's working in a sweatshop or starving. So, right? so from a first world perspective, of course these look like terrible things. Right, but it's precisely because it is terrible that we want to increase the choice set. We want to give these people more opportunities. And of course we had sweatshops in the United States at one point too. But here's the cool thing. Eventually we became wealthy enough where we could bring our kids home from the factories and send them to school. I tell my students and all you students, think about how great your wealth is. You can take four, five, six years off from working on the family farm 
to sit around studying, reading, drinking, talking to your, your, your fellow students, your professors. I mean, talk about a great life, right? But it always wasn't like that. And the problem is we have a tendency is in, in the first world to impose our worldview, what we think is good, among, on poor countries. It's not in the feasibility set. So my contention is when people boycott these things, when they want to outlaw them, when they want to artificially inflate wages, what they then tend to do is hurt these people. They make them actually worse off on net. And, and remember, too, with the fair trade thing, they're just an interest group. They lobby government. So the same people that, that, that upset you about these fair trade, uh, free trade agreements, the fair trade people are no different. They're trying to manipulate government policy for something they like. So ultimately what happens with all these groups is they just want stuff. This is what I value, and I want government to force it upon people, whether it's fair trade, whether it's free trade agreements that benefit me at your expense, the banana farmers. That's ultimately what it is. And my view is let's get rid of all of it. I want to get rid of all the interest group influence, and I think that should be the end we, we strive towards. So I think we should recognize the benefits from free trade, and, and free trade has become bastardized precisely because of the points you raise. Free trade is not manipulating global outcomes to benefit a small group of producers. That's mercantilism or crony capitalism. It's abusing the political system to generate personal benefit. What we want is equal access to markets for everyone. And the way you do that is to reduce trade barriers. Um, just a couple points on that. Well, first of all, this is just a personal opinion, but I would like to see us stop referring to ourselves as the first world because I believe we have one world. And it's just poor nations, rich nations, that's it. But the other thing is, is I, I agree with you and I disagree with you and we could go on and about that and I know that I don't have time to do that. But the thing is, is I think that I, I don't see viable alternatives and maybe I need to get your book to do that. So maybe that's the, the book doesn't talk about it all, all okay. these issues. There are books I can recommend to you. But the viable alternative is trading with people. That's how people become wealthy through but, trade. But I see, that, you know, unless we get rid of the debt, and, and, that, and that was imposed, you know, when you go back to Bretton Woods, and you have to go back to what our government did, you know, after World War II, and started this. And sure. so we, we have impoverished these nations, and that, that is a fact. All right, so I, I agree we should, we should erase the debt, and we also shouldn't lend money to countries that can't pay it back. So well, I, but, future, but, I, would, I, would, I would cut foreign aid to zero as well. But I don't want to, I don't want to punish, you know, the, the people of these of these other nations. Sure, I agree, but here's, here's or blame them. Right? Maybe that's the thing. But here's I mean, another benefit of markets, by the way. You and I, as private individuals, can send our money to whoever we want. So don't punish anyone. You can send your money to whoever you want abroad. I can keep mine, right? And the problem is the problem is what we have here is governments instead of individual citizens acting. We have governments imposing stuff upon each other and citizens. That's the fundamental problem of all the points you're raising. You say the governments burden these people with debt. Right, the governments did. What? Other governments they did, and the citizens suffer. So the fundamental problem here is a bloated and bureaucratic government instead of allowing citizens to actually um, be free. But we should continue, because a couple okay. people only got to, but we could talk after. I appreciate your comments very much. You said at the beginning of your talk that you were going to take them at their premise that uh, the intention with an occupation or reconstruction is to spread liberal democracy. Whether I believe in that or not is, is different, but have, in your research have you found that there are indeed other motivations, and as an ec economist, that they may be economic in nature? Oh, sure. Yeah, this is an excellent point. And this is one of the points that I've, I'm somewhat frustrated because people always misunderstand me. They say I'm naive, and then I say, see, they don't really want to spread democracy. They want oil. They want this. They want that. And I say, okay, point well taken. But here's what I tried to do in, in when I did the book. I tried to get... Um, analyze the best case scenario. So let's assume actually the best of intentions. And what I tried to do is um, analyze that. And I, my conclusion is I'm skeptical even under the best of intentions. So what does that mean? If it's true that there's other motivations, which I think there are, we should be even more skeptical. Because under the best case scenarios, we can't do it very well. Then you add in this other stuff, and it's like, all right, so now we have politicians that can't do it even if they said it, and they're liars. So now there's really no reason to support these things, right? So I think that just strengthens my argument. So it's not an issue of, of uh, I just want to make clear, it's not that I believe that politicians always want to do what they say, right? A lot of times they say stuff in order to get public support. But what I try to do in the book is take, take the best case scenario. I do think there's other motivations. Uh, I do think they can be good or bad, right? But as an economist, I can't judge people's motivations, so I take them as given. That's the best I can do. And that's a limit of, the, that's a limit of economics, so I try to be careful with what I say and don't say. Yes, please. Sir, have you ever heard of a gentleman by the name of Richard Cobden? Yes, I have. Can you tell us a little bit about him? 
Um, well, I don't know the whole history, but do you know more about Richard Comden and his history? Uh, well, Richard Comden was, was a hardcore free trader during the Corn Law uh, era, right? He was uh, arguing for free trade in Britain, and, 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 uh, and basically he was pointing out a lot of the, sa lot of the same things I was pointing out, uh, the benefits of free trade and how uh, basically rhetoric by politicians trying to help people was basically uh, manipulation by special interest groups to benefit a small group. Um, so he's a very important free trader. Uh, that's been forgotten by uh, and neglected. Well, he's also a contemporary of Marx. Now, I want to make the contrast here that Marx was um, no economist, necessarily. He just had some radical political theories. But you say, for instance, that you're in favor of sweatshops. Is that right? Well, not in the book. We're getting off topic. But yeah, I am. Okay. We can talk. I mean, I'll, I don't know how much I want. I can give a whole talk on this, too, but yes, okay. I am. Okay, so in what, Howard Zinn quotes, after so many years in Philadelphia, there were 284,000 children working in sweatshops 55 hours a week. Now, is it your position that those were necessary sacrifices for the growth of capitalism? Um, not, nece not necessary sacrifices. I believe that parents sent their kids to their factories because the alternative was working in the farm and or starving. So given the feasibility of, at the time, the, uh, that was the best alternative facing them. Just like sweatshops are the best alternative facing them today, or they wouldn't go there. No one forced them to go there. No one forces them to go there. Don't you think it should be the ethical policy of the United States to deal with governments which offer programs for improved infrastructure, vis-a-vis -vis schools, uh, child welfare acts, these sorts of regulatory measures, which in hindsight we can look at our own history and say were abuses of power? No, I don't. I think that when that happens, the uh, basically, look, we've sent tons of foreign aid abroad to build schools, to, to, to fund wonderful programs. They always sound so nice. But for some reason, if you look at the actual education numbers in poor countries, they don't go up. And here's why. The money doesn't get spent well because it goes into the hands of corrupt government officials, or students don't have an incentive to learn because when they're done learning, what do they do? They go be a corrupt official themselves. So why invest in human capital when there's no payoff to human capital? The problem with poor countries is simple. There's a lack of respect for private property rights. And when you don't have a respect for private property rights, there's no incentive to invest in your own human capital or in, the, uh, or in investments in other types of capital. So the government policy, the problem, what I want to emphasize to people is that we, we have this view that the government deals with people. It does. But really what we care about is individuals dealing with individuals. And here's the beauty of markets. If you don't like someone for whatever reason, you don't have to trade with them. You can voluntarily exclude it. So you don't like sweatshops. You can not buy it. You don't like your grocer down the street. You don't have to buy from him either. That's the power of markets. So let's say we actually implemented my, my policy implications. All right, we have free trade with Iran, which I would advocate, by the way. Um, you don't want to trade with Iran. Great. You don't have to. Maybe I do, right? And I think that's a better position than um, trying to do things. Because of course, when this happens, it turns into rhetoric, and then really none of the stuff ever really gets implemented. So these welfare programs sound nice. But here's, here's the thing to think about. Our government programs in this country pretty much are, they're pretty bad, right? Our education system's pretty bad, bad. We have Medicaid, Medicare, Social Security problems, right? We can't even get them right here. So if we can't get them right in the developed, if we don't want to use the term first world, that's fine. If we can't get them right in the developed world, where our government institutions are pretty good, where we consider basic property rights to be pretty well protected, what makes us think that we can do this, or governments in these countries, other countries that are relatively poor can do it? There's no reason to think it at all, which is precisely why it doesn't work. Uh, sir, sir, you make the point that other countries don't want to invest in their human capital, but a system No, people is, don't. Countries people don't, don't have human capital. Well, people and countries and systems are only as good as the people which are in them. Now, you make a point that there is a difference in, this edu in, in our educational system. I understand we're low on time, but do you understand that, there, that these problems are possibly caused by massive inequities within our own economic system, and that these policies you may be advocating may only contribute to those worldwide? Uh, no, I believe that capitalism lifts all tides. When you trade with people, everyone's better off. It's not that there's an income gap. There's always an income gap. I don't think the income cap is a bad thing. In fact, when people get wealthy, it's a sign that they're making people better off. So uh, I, don't, and I think that inequalities come when governments abuse private property rights and, and fail to respect individual rights. That's where I think inequalities emerge. I want to move on and take the other people behind you. We can talk after. I appreciate your comments. It's just very a lot. I can't get to it all. Um, I have a quick question. Well, it's not really quick, but... Um, uh, I've done a lot of research, and actually I find that a lot of your points are very valid. Um, but one critique that I've seen is that uh, in, uh, when I use the term environment here, I don't necessarily mean you know, global warming and all the other you know, things commonly associated with you know, the environmental movement, but actually how people have resources. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to have free trade with, for instance, you mentioned Haiti in the book, 
um, you, in your uh, in your tables. Um, Haiti does is run is, one of their main problems is that they don't have um, resources necessary to trade with. They have a very you know almost no economy at all to begin with, and they have no civil society because there's no there's no organization based on um, an economy there. So how do you um, answer those issues of environment and you know actually developing economies? Because by having free trade, you need to have kind of an already economy, something to trade back in order to trade with. Sure. Well, there's a couple. Again, this is a very deep issue. I'll just raise a couple points. First of all, um, many countries have become wealthy with very few natural resources. That's not a binding constraint. Uh, actually, countries with a lot of natural resources can do very badly. It's called the natural resource curse. In the Middle East, there's lots of oil wealthy countries that are very bad, and precisely because the political political elite can skim off the oil revenues and abuse their citizens. They don't have to collect tax revenues, so they don't have to protect their citizens or provide standard public goods. Um, the problem with Haiti is the reason they don't, the fundamental question is not that they don't have an economy, it's why. And the reason why is because there's an elite, a political elite, which basically coerces and abuses the rest of the country. The exact thing that we know leads to poverty. When there's a small group of people that hold political power and basically bash you over the head any time you do something productive, people don't have an incentive to do anything productive. It's all about incentives. The Previous gentleman's comments about education and the goodness of the people, people respond to incentives no matter where you are in the world. And if you don't have the incentives to act in a proper way, you won't. So the, the strongest incentive is private property. When you grant people private property rights over their being, over property that they um, mix their labor with, uh, that's how countries become wealthy. All right, do we have time for one more? No. One, more. one more, very quick. Okay. Um I have a question in regards to the private property and the resources you just mentioned. You said that there are countries with a good, good deal of resources that are impoverished. And um, as far as I understand it, a lot of places they're impoverished because of their resources being in private hands that are far in private hands, particularly Americans. So um, the woman earlier mentioned uh, Dole Fruit Company, for example. And the reason that the workers are getting paid so poorly is not because um, of necessarily just unfair trade, but also the fact that there's a private corporation that is not um, an indigenous corporation. The resources are not in their hands. And I think that that's part of the problem around the world. And we talk about free trade. We have to consider that um, a large deal of our resources are um, concentrated in the hands of a few number of very, very wealthy people that don't have the interest of the um, workers and people that live in these countries. Sure. In Again, this is very complex, a couple points. Um, my view on this is pretty straightforward, which is absent some kind of coercive ability, you can't exploit, abuse people, unless you can coerce them. But if they don't have resources, they don't have anything else to offer except their labor. So you uh, sure, that's necessarily good. are That's good. Labor is a resource, by the way. That's I, one resource. I understand many, that, right? but don't you think that they should have access to their resources? No, I don't. You know, for the same reason, I don't think people living in Connecticut should be able to travel outside Connecticut. Should we say that people in Connecticut can't leave Connecticut because they own, because people in, only but, people in New York should have access to New York resources, and then we can keep pushing that down until you're just living on your little space? No, of but land. they've they've stolen these resources already. Okay, that's right. Exactly right. But that's that a private property issue. So we yes. come back again to private property. When we protect private property rights, we get good outcomes. When you allow a political elite to steal them, and those corporations, but it's by the way- not political leaps, it's American corporations in you, particular. Yes, that partner with corrupt governments abroad. That's precisely how, it's not like governments, I've never seen a corporation go abroad with guns and take over property. But this, is, this goes back 200 years, and so yes, you're right, they're partnering with corrupt governments, but when you're talking about this ideal of private property, it's so easily corrupted that I, I, don't, I don't think that you can have this ideal of free trade without someone taking advantage. Sure, and, and you know what, but, but here's the thing, the ideal of free trade is no different than the ideal of fair trade and fair wages, which are just empty phrases of basically, I think this is of the right salary. So at the end of the day, what happens is they're all ideas, we're, ideals we're talking about, right? And it's just movement towards one ideal over another. I think it's time to go. I appreciate all your comments and your time. I'll Thank be you. around for a little bit if you want to talk. Thank you all very much.